I came to the temple in San Francisco, and I um, was there for a couple of weeks, and uh, the devotees were on their way to, La to um, London to open the London temple under Prabhupada's order. So I, um, I went with them. They were going to be stopping in Montreal to see, to see Srila Prabhupada, get his blessings for their London preaching. And I went with them to be initiated by Prabhupada in Montreal. And then the plan was that I was going to Boston to um, join the painting group that was painting in Boston and at that time. So um, I, I first saw Prabhupada in Montreal. And we, he was staying at that time on West Prince Arthur Street in a house. And I went there to that house with Malati, Shama Shindar, Jamuna, Gurudas, that group, and, um, and with baby Saraswati. So the first time I saw Prabhupada, we, we went to this house and ran across these stones and, and um, came into Prabhupada's room. And I remember my first impression of Prabhupada was he was absolutely effulgent. It was just like the room was completely um, brilliant effulgence coming from him. And I remember reading that um, in, in, um, in books that when you, when you see your, your true guru, he will be effulgent like that. And he truly was. He was, he was absolutely, um, it was like a Brahma Jyoti seeing him. He was just filling the room with light. They um, sort of presented me to Prabhupada. They said, this is Wendy. She's only 16 years old. And uh, she's become a devotee, wants to be your disciple. And Prabhupada, it was really, it was really quite, um, his compassion was so, so great. He, he, he saw me and they said, he, I was 16 years old, and he said, but where are your parents? It's so funny to think of um, the most compassionate Prabhupada, um, so concerned for, for, uh, for my parents' suffering that I wasn't with them. And uh, so that was very sweet. Well, but where are your parents? He wanted them to, to go and, and um, actually start a trend. He wanted the story of, um, of uh, Mr. Charles Chaplin, that he was, he was at a dance with a lady, and he was sitting on a bench with the lady outside. They, they went out on the terrace, and then some naughty boys um, he was wearing a tailcoat, and some naughty boys came from behind him and with a hammer and nails and nailed his tailcoat to the bench. And so then when he stood up, he saw that his tailcoat was ripped. So he went into the men's room and he ripped it more. And then he came out of the men's room and started dancing with even more flourish than the other men. And so the other Dancers were looking at him and, and thinking, oh, this is the new trend. So they all also went into the men's room and ripped their tailcoats and started dancing just like him. So this was his, Prabhupada's instruction, how he wanted them to, to um, plant the seed of Krishna consciousness in England, to start a trend, and certainly they did that. They were the right people to do that. So then they went on to meet the Beatles and, um, and started a, a Hare Krishna um, really sensation in England. At my initiation, I believe it was the first time Prabhupada told the story of Rukmini. And um, maybe because I was such a, such a little girl, maybe something reminded him of Rukmini. And so he told the story of Rukmini for the first time. And he said, so your name is Rukmini? Uh, he said, you are a beautiful girl. Krishna can accept any number of beautiful girls. So, um, your name is Rukmini? And, um, and then he, he said, um, let's see, your name is Rukmini? You're a beautiful girl. Krishna can accept any number of beautiful girls. And then he said, he said, you are, you are a beautiful girl, so now become beautiful within also. It was a very, very beautiful instruction, very powerful instruction. He was so loving that he, 
he saw me and he saw that I was, was too thin and, and like a grandfather, he was very concerned. And so he said that we should be separated. It was really quite amazing. And so um, he, uh, I, I stayed in New York and Bardraj was at that time um, painting in Boston. And so I asked, Brahmananda was the temple president in New York and I asked him if I could go to Los Angeles to learn Pujari work. So I went to Los Angeles for some time. And then I was there for, it was an extended time. It was maybe, maybe about six months or something like that. And I was um, very happy doing Pujari work and learning from Shilavati and very, very nice time. So then Prabhupada was away um, for a long time in London and Germany at that time. And then he, he was coming back after a very extended time and he was coming into Los Angeles. Well, what happened was he came into perhaps New York and then Boston after being away for a very long time, maybe, maybe a year. And he saw Bardraj and he said, where is your wife? <laughs> and Bardraj said, well, you sent her away, Prabhupada. <laughs> She's in Los Angeles. And he said, should I send for her? And Prabhupada said, yes, husband without the wife is only one half. Wife without the husband is only one half. So, so I, had, <laughs> I had the order to, to go back to Boston. There was one evening where he was, he was looking around the room and he said, he was looking at each and every devotee and he said, I want each and every one of you to open a temple. And he was looking at the, into the face of each devotee. And um, so I, my impetuous per personality, I said, Swamiji, at that time, he was called Swamiji, I said, Swamiji, even the girls? And he was laughing. He was always very grandfatherly. And um, he, said, he said, yes, there is no difference. When you are preaching, there is no difference. He, and he began to speak about Janava Mata, that in the absence of Lord Nityananda, she was leading the whole Sankirtan movement. So he said, yes, there is no difference. It's very, very nice instruction. There was a, um, a, 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 a man who was, um, he was a bearded yogi, and he was staying at the New York temple at that time. And he, he was staying at the temple for some time, and he was teaching Pradumna Sanskrit. And he would go on Harinam Sankirtan with us on the street. And he would stand in the front. And no one really thought much of it. He was, but in retrospect, um, he was really sort of posing as, he was, as though he were the guru. And he was teaching Pradyumna Sanskrit. And um, so when Prabhupada came, he should, he should really tell this story because he was, have you interviewed him already? He didn't tell the story. Well, anyway, there was a big scene in Prabhupada's room. This, this yogi brought some woman in, uh, in with him into Prabhupada's room, and they began screaming and yelling at Prabhupada. And it was a, a, a terrible, embarrassing scene. He was very offensive. And then I remember Prabhupada um, speaking from the Vyasasan about this yogi and looking at Pradumna, and he was saying, is not a snake with a jewel in his hood even more dangerous. It was very, it was just his, um, his, his compassion and his grace and his um, aristocratic demeanor, and just sitting on the Vyasasan and saying, is not a snake with a jewel in his hood even more dangerous? Very amazing story. At that time there was a temple in, a, in the um, neighborhood of the, um, em where the embassies and the diplomats lived, and it was not really a very good location for a temple. Not so many people were coming. It was um, Anan Niketan, I believe, was the name of the, the area. And the um, Prabhupada had a room on the top of this particular house. Um, the temple was, it was a house, and then Prabhupada, Prabhupada had the, the room on the roof. And he was speaking in his room one night. 
and we came into the room and um, one sannyasi was playing the harmonium um, and, and, and we walked in and Prabhupada saw Bharadraj and he said, he said, let him play, he is better. So he had the sannyasi give up the harmonium, he wanted Bharadraj to play, he loved Bharadraj's harmonium. And so Bharadraj began to play the harmonium and, and then after the uh, kirtan, Prabhupada was speaking and he, I was sort of sitting toward the back, and he, he began to, he was, he was quoting from the Sikshastakam, and the, there were many sannyasis in the room, and Pradumna was there, he, who he always called Panditji, and as Prabhupada would sometimes do, I, I believe he was testing the devotees, just to, you know, he was, he was starting to quote this verse, but appearing to not remember the the verse he was saying, Nayanam Galada. What is that? Nayanam Galada. And so I was sort of sitting at the back, and there was a room full of people who were uh, much higher in the hierarchy than I was, and none of them appeared to know the verse. And so I just very quietly said, Nayanam Galada Shudaraya. And Prabhupada, his eyes got very big. He said, yes, what is that? What is that verse? And I said the verse. And he was looking around, teasing them, <laughs> looking you know, to make sure that they noted that. So as he did that, my head started to get bigger. <laughs> of course, I fell into the trap, false pride. And so then he, he tried it again. And he started to quote the last verse of the Sikh Shastik prayers, Asli Siva. What is that verse? And I guess they had memorized other verses. <laughs> and so, um, so I, I, I again said the verse, Asli Siva Padre Tam Pinastuma. And he said, yes, what is that verse? He made me chant the, the verse. And, and then he, he looked at all of them and he said, you see, this little girl, she knows. <laughs> you don't know, she knows. It was very very much the grandfather, the teasing grandfather. But then, of course, my head swelled and I, I was not any better. And so then he had to take care of my false ego. So then he said, he, he, said, he began to talk about the Ugra Karma civilization and uh, how people are working so hard, such long hours in such hellish factories. And he said, just like they have these, uh, what, it is, what is it called, a uh, uh, crucible. He said, they have these gigantic crucibles. And I went, hmm. And he looked at me and he said, oh, you know what is crucible? <laughs> but I really didn't. But I said, well, <laughs> a crucible is like one of those little rooms where those monks meditate, and he just tossed his head disgustedly, <laughs> throwing it away. And he said, does anyone know what is crucible? <laughs> and then Brahmananda was there, and he said, he said, yes, a crucible is one of these vast um, forms in which they melt this molten steel for making the the um, beams for building the skyscrapers. And Prabhupada said, yes, that is crucible. And he looked at me. <laughs> so I was properly chastised. That was a nice memory. They were writing to Prabhupada that, that the new temple is like a palace. And um, I was very distraught about this because I was thinking, Prabhupada will be so disappointed when he comes. They're telling him it's a palace, but it's really only another storefront that's a little bit nicer. And I was very, I was thinking, oh, here Prabhupada's coming in. And I was thinking that he's going to be so disappointed, or maybe he'll be angry, and what's going to happen? And I was very distraught about this. So um, the first temple was just a, a right off the Bowery at, on 2nd Avenue. And then the, the second temple was at 61 Second Avenue, just a few blocks up, and it was a one-floor walk-up. It had been a tuxedo shop, and there were mirrors on the wall, so it was a little bit more um, uh, gala storefront. So 
hear Prabhupada's coming and they're telling him it's a palace. And so Prabhupada did come in. He came in at the airport. Perhaps that's the time when they're dancing, the beautiful tape of the devotees dancing with Prabhupada. But so he came in at the airport. He came in to the new temple and he sat down on his Vyasasan and he said, he said, I prayed to Krishna to, give, to send me one moon, but he has sent me so many moon-like boys and girls. And I was just so amazed at his, his uh, just his gratitude and his, his love. That here, I thought he would be disappointed or perhaps angry. And he was uh, so grateful for even the slightest um, endeavor of service. I remember this one particular gentleman. He seemed like a very pious man to me, elderly Indian gentleman, looked very pious. But Prabhupada always seemed to be able to see the heart of the person. And, and so this man was saying to Prabhupada, Swamiji, give us your mercy, give us your mercy. In a very, it seemed like a very ardent way to me. And Prabhupada was just very offhanded with him. And he said, I have already given everything. Still you do not take. What is the use? And I was so shocked that the way Prabhupada, sometimes he, he would seem to give so much mercy to someone who seems so undeserving. And this man seemed very pious to me. And then Prabhupada gave him the example. He said, just like a man, he has fallen in a well. Someone throws him a rope, but he does not take. It was just... It was, it was very, um, very, um, very har harsh, but um, still like, like a bittersweet compassion he gave this man. That time he told some stories in his room one night. He was telling about, he was speaking about common sense. And he said, he was talking about about real intelligence, if a man, if a man is intelli he said, if a man is intelligent, he will, when he li is lying on his back, he will naturally count the rafters. Very interesting. He was talking about common sense intelligence and the ability to be observant. And so he began to tell different stories. He said that when he was a, a, a child, during the rainy season in Calcutta, there would be a dripping pipe outside the window, and he would use the sound of that dripping pipe as a metronome, and he would practice his murdanga beats faster and slower according to the dripping of the, of the pipe. And then he, he told one story about um, a train called the Punjab Mail, that a man was applying for a job, and there was a question on this job application, have you ever ridden the Punjab Mail? And the applicant said, yes, many times. And so the next question was, how many cars are there on the Punjab mail, the train that brings the mail to Punjab? So the idea was, if, if you're intelligent, you will have noticed how many, if you ride that train, you will have noticed how many cars are on that train. And then he told another similar story. That a man was applying for a job. Two men, two applicants came. And there was the man who was interviewing the applicants and, and his assistant. So one man came in, he sat down, he uh, had his interview, he had many qualifications for the job, he um, was dismissed, he did not close the door after him, and he, he left. And then another man came, took his interview, sat down, took his interview, and uh, he had none of the necessary qualifications for the job. But as he was dismissed, he closed the door properly behind him. And so the assistant to the interviewer said, the interviewer said to his assistant, who, who do you think will get the job? And the man said, of course, the man with all the qualifications. And his uh, director said, no, this man who has none of the qualifications will be given the job. But why? He said, because he closed the door behind him. So he will be able to be trained. We will be able to work with him. The other man, although he has the qualifications, 
he was not observant to, to close the door properly. So we won't be able to work with him in our company. So very interesting um, instructions about common sense and, and intelligence he was giving in his room in Vrindavan. And then I remember um, Nanda Kumar was serving Prabhupada at that time. And Nanda Kumar came out of Prabhupada's room one, uh, one day and he was just bewildered and shaking his head and he said to me, Prabhupada said the most amazing thing. He said that I'm too creative to be a good servant. He said I should do business. And I thought, at that time I thought, what's creative about business? And I, I was really very surprised, and he was also surprised, but in retrospect I can see that business really is very creative. And now I find myself doing business and I can see um, how, how right Prabhupada is. And, and um, I've often mentioned that to people also. Yeah. There's a quality that Lord Krishna is described as being bhavagrahi janardhanam, that he just accepts the essence of the bhaktas um, love or devotion that's offered to him. He accepts the essence of the offering. So Prabhupada was so much like that. He, he really just took the essence of what a person was offering. He could see right through and see right to the essence of what was being presented. Um, if someone was approaching him with arrogance, he could cut right through that. Or there was just a kernel of sincerity, he would take that. And um, he saw what, what, um, what was hidden and what no one else would see. He was, he was so um, totally unstereotyped and so, um, so transcendent. So e each word is, doesn't describe him completely because you could say so aristocratic but yet so childlike with childlike innocence and so, so meek and humble but yet with a, um, the, the regal air of a king but yet like a child. Mm -hmm so beautiful, so, um, so unassuming, and so, so imminently present at every moment, um, observant to every detail, and, and yet so kind to, to everyone. I remember once in Boston, um, we had a very small little temple, and there was only one brahmachari. Devananda was the brahmachari. Satsrupa was there, he was the temple president. And this brahmachari was having some difficulties. And Prabhupada at that time, Prabhupada, this was about maybe 1968 or 69, Prabhupada would, anyone who was having trouble would go travel with Prabhupada for a while. He would, that would be the medicine, go travel with Prabhupada. He would take the person who was having some trouble. So he, he, um, Devananda had expressed some desire to travel with Prabhupada. And so Prabhupada was asking Satsvarupa if he could have Devananda to go travel with him. He was the only brahmachari. And so Satsvarupa, he had his immediate reaction. He said, well, Prabhupada, if, if you give me someone else. And Prabhupada said, oh, conditional. <laughs> Choose.